It's time for the Kim Hammer Show, where you'll learn how your state government affects you, your family, and community. Here's Kim Hammer. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Kim Hammer Show. Thanks for tuning in either here on 101.1 FM, The Answer, or on Facebook Live. We're glad that you're listening today. Uh, going to be a little bit of a stormy afternoon, a little bit of a rainy weekend, so I uh, hope you can get advantage to take it. I hope you can take advantage of it while it's uh, not raining. We're going to get right into the show because we've got a really full show today. Um, my guest today, in just a second, will be Alan McLean, who is the Arkansas Insurance Commissioner. And we're going to talk about what your rights are as far as your insurance policies being canceled uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Then I'm going to have uh, two physicians on at two separate times today. Dr. Mark Alby will be on, and then Dr. Michael Pafford will be on uh, we'll talk about the COVID-19 and just from uh, dealing with it from the trenches as physicians, some of the things that they're seeing and experiencing, and just get some feedback from those that are actually dealing with it. And then we're going to have Congressman Bruce Westerman on from 1235 to about 1250. So we've got a really full hour. So we hope that you uh, feel uh, more educated. We hope that you are benefited by it. want to thank our, our uh, sponsors that help make this show possible. Everett's Buick GMC down in Saline County there at I-30 and the Alcoa Overpass. Believe it or not, it's a great time to buy a car, and it's always a good time to get your car serviced. So I recommend you go by and check out Everett's Buick GMC there at I-30 in the Alcoa Overpass on Saline County. They'll take care of you both before, during, and after the sale. You'll get some really good uh, prices and really good service from Everett Buick GMC. Then for your real estate needs, as always, Baxley, Pinfield, Mowdy, uh, they can serve you here in central Arkansas, whether you have residential, commercial that you want to buy or sell, or maybe you're looking for rental property, commercial or residential. They're a great resource for all your real estate needs here in central Arkansas. And then always Edwards Food Stores here in central Arkansas. Uh, I was in the Edwards Food Store in Bryant this morning. I can tell you that the pandemic is under control because the sh- the uh, shelves were stocked with toilet paper and paper towels and their meat market uh, was full. I saw people walking by toilet paper and paper towels, not picking them up. So that tells you that the pandemic is about to get under control, but you go to Edwards food store and you can get good friendly service. I actually saw somebody loading up the groceries for them and it's just a great place to shop here in central Arkansas or over there in East Arkansas. Either way, if you want to send in a question today, we've got Ben Bowers over here watching our Facebook page. Just go up to the comment section, and you can leave a question either for the physicians that will be on or for Congressman Westerman. Or if you want to get a question in to uh, the Arkansas Insurance Commissioner, uh, Alan McLean, who's going to join us in just a second, just send that in, and we'll be glad to try to get your questions answered. But let's start off the show with the Arkansas Insurance Commissioner, Alan McLean. And, Alan, thank you for taking time uh, this afternoon to be on the Kim Hammer Show. It's my pleasure, Senator. Glad to be here and uh, share any information I might be able to do with, uh, with with your listeners today. Let's get right into it. We uh, There are some folks that are a little bit anxious, uh, especially if they've become unemployed regarding their insurance products. And we'll just kind of say that open-endedly, whether it's insurance or life or automobile. Uh, can you just kind of speak as to what the rights of the citizens are if they're in a position that they've lost their uh, employment and kind of help alleviate some of the concerns about what the law says they have in the way of protections? Sure. There, there are a couple of things that we're watching here at the insurance department. And, and one, uh, two, a couple of things, uh, one regarding health insurance and that a number of people have employer-based health insurance. And due to the pandemic, they've either been furloughed, laid off, uh, re- had a reduction in their hours, or uh, uh, unable to, to uh, maintain that employer-based health insurance. And uh, most people, uh, when they don't have any other uh, sources of, of health insurance, a, a lot of people will look to the Arkansas Health Insurance Marketplace, and which is something that under uh, a part of uh, in conjunction with insurance department. And so, you have uh, there's a 60 day uh, period of time that you after you've lost your job due to, due to a COVID related event that that you can uh, just no no additional open enrollment. You, you know, don't have to wait until October or anything. You just go to the, uh, call the Arkansas Health Insurance Marketplace and, and discuss options for getting health insurance. And so uh, I do have a phone number for that. I'll just put out there that it's 844 uh, 
844-355-3262. Then the website is myarinsurance.com. And that gets you straight to what's called a navigator, and they will look at different situations and uh, the eligibility to, to, to get on the marketplace and get some type of, of health insurance coverage. So that, that's one thing that we that the consumers seem to be uh, interested in, understandably, when they uh, unexpectedly lose lose their health insurance coverage. Uh, another another uh, directive we have given, uh, as and it is consistent across the country, is for uh, for policyholders who are not able to to continue making premium payments uh, due to COVID related job loss or economic circumstances or or health related issues, which keeps you from from working. Uh, so the, we we carriers are um, directed to 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 allow a 45 day moratorium on a payment of insurance premiums. So it's something that the policyholder does have to request of their insurance carrier. It's not automatic, and it's not a forgiveness of the premium. It just basically puts that on hold, keeps the carrier from being able to cancel their their coverage or penalize them. Uh, for not paying their their their, their premiums and giving giving them time to to get caught back up uh, financially in which to do that. So that, that that that's regarding policies. And then we we give, gave a little guidance regarding uh, claim settlement that we we've had a had a rule that's existing a long time here uh, with the department that that just reminds insurance carriers to 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 uh, adjust their claims uh, quickly and uh, uh, fairly and and we we reminded them that 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 hasn't changed just because there's a pandemic uh, certainly insurance carriers and staff across the country are impacted by the uh, the the um, the change in workforce within their own companies and are having to make some adjustments, but um, we sent out an advisory uh, just reminding all insurers and regulated industries that they must continue to adjust their claims expeditiously um, as possible uh, during, during this emergency. So if you've had a car claim or a health claim or you know any type of claim, um, they, they shouldn't be dragging their feet and getting that taken care of. So yeah. Let me go back and hit on one point you mentioned because I think it's important for people to know I had the uh, – uh, director of Fair, Mar- uh, Fair Housing on last week, and we were talking about rent and that just because you may get a moment of relief from paying your rent doesn't mean that you're released from the obligation for paying that amount. It's just that it's going to be a situation where, you know, it's workable over time by the landlord. By the same token, if somebody gets a little bit of a reprieve from the insurance company as far as paying the premium, it doesn't necessarily forgive them from having to pay that amount. It's just that the insurance company is making it affordable through these difficult times, maybe through payments or delayed payments. Is that an accurate statement? Yes, sir. That's 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 uh, exactly it. Uh, we we remind in our uh, our directive and our bulletin that that it's only an extension or a grace period in which to pay the pay the premiums, and it's it's not a waiver. It's just a moratorium. It just puts it on pause for a little while. Now, go back to the insurance marketplace, because I've been around the Capitol long enough that I remember when that used to be a standalone entity, and then under your predecessor, the marketplace was moved under the insurance commissioner's office uh, to handle that product line. What, What are the products that are available, again, for clarity through the insurance marketplace, and is it strictly for those that have lost their insurance, or are people able to go there? to maybe find a better option for an insurance product or bring some clarity as to what the insurance marketplace exactly is? Yes, sir. It, it is for health insurance, and it's um, that that um, particularly for health insurance. And there are certain qualifying events that allows you to 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 uh, to you know, seek seek the coverage under the the the, uh, the marketplace. Losing job based health coverage, uh, you can lose individual health coverage that on a policy you had bought yourself um, or you've lost eligibility for Medicare or Medicaid or if your family member you'd had coverage with a family member and you you know needed you know, needed to to get coverage maybe a 26 year old or 27 year old who lost their 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 group health coverage with their parents or something and they they can 
get on the marketplace at that time. So that there, there are a number of qualifying events uh, that that would uh, allow somebody to get health insurance uh, through the um, through through the marketplace. So. Okay. Um, with regards to um, other insurance issues you mentioned about, I noticed uh, through some of the flyers and just through the insurance company that I have my insurance with that they have actually extended the offer to um, lower the premium uh, for uh, you know for a little period of time. Are you having a lot of problem with uh, and and I I work with or I have my insurance with a reputable company so. Uh, and I work with a local agent, so I can pick up the phone and call them directly. But are you seeing uh, cases of fraud, or are there situations where uh, companies of less integrity are trying to take advantage of the citizens, and are you dealing with that in any area? No, sir. Those, those have not been uh, been been made known to us. Uh, any, any time that there is a, a rate increase or decrease, it does come across my desk and the, the, the desk of our, our rate analyst, and we, we watch those pretty carefully to make sure that there's no, uh, that any rate increase that anybody's doing is justified actuarially and put them through quite a bit of rigor before we improve any, approve any rate increases. Uh, likewise, we have seen uh, some rate rate decreases in certain lines just because the um, uh, the activity hasn't been there and the risk hasn't been there as much. So uh, there, there's a little bit of it you know, both ways. But no, sir, I haven't seen any had any fraud reported to us, and we do watch that pretty carefully. Very good. Anything else you'd like to tell the uh, the folks as far as the insurance industry during this time, or uh, any other information you want to put out? Well, I do want to make sure that uh, that, that I put out the number for our um, our consumer services division in case anybody does suspect any fraud or has any issues with uh, their carrier. And so that that 800 number directly to our consumer services direct um, director and and office is one eight hundred eight five two five four nine four. Eight hundred eight five two five four nine four, and our website is uh, insurance.arkansas.gov. And so we'd always encourage any citizen to give us a call. Uh, we we take every every complaint and concern seriously, and um, want to make sure all aspects, whether it's whether they're trying to secure coverage, or whether they're on the other end of it trying to get a, a claim uh, taken care of, that that we're there to assist in any way possible. All right, so that 800-852-5494 is just kind of the general general overall number that if anybody has a question or maybe they're in a position uh, where they're afraid that they're going to lose their insurance or uncertain about where they are with regards to keeping their insurance, uh, they can call that number, and then you can direct them from there, correct? Yeah, yeah that goes straight to our Consumer Services Division who handles all the complaints and concerns, that's for sure. So okay. that that would be, and then if it's something else that anybody else in the department can help with, they'll get them to me or anybody else that uh, uh, that can do. I'm at the office every day. We have a, uh, uh, mo- a lot of our staff are, uh, are adjusting their schedules a little bit due to due to the distancing required in offices. But I'm here every day, and our senior management team is and uh, uh, taking care of things. Very good. So if you want those numbers, you can go up to uh, my website. Uh, ben will get them put up on there. That's the KimHammerShow.com, the KimHammerShow.com. We'll have that phone number for the marketplace in case you're in a position where you're afraid that you're going to lose your insurance or you have questions about it. That will be a good resource. Then we'll get the overall number up there as well uh, in case you have any other issues. And that's just not – we're kind of talking health insurance because that's what is on a lot of people's mind. But with regard to any other insurance issue in the state of Arkansas – uh, Mr. McLean and his uh, his staff over there are a good resource to go to. Alan, thank you for taking time to be on the Kim Hammer Show this afternoon and tell your family thank you for giving up a little of your time. And <laughs> hope you have a great weekend, sir. Our pleasure, Senator. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. All right. All right. Next on the line, we have uh, Dr. Michael Pafford. And before we bring him on the line again, I want to thank my sponsors for the Kim Hammer Show. That would be Everett B- Buick GMC. Uh, down in Saline County and Baxley Phillips Mountie Real Estate can take care of all your real estate needs here in Central Arkansas. And then Edwards Food Store throughout Central Arkansas and over in East Arkansas. Uh, those are three great companies that can take care of all your needs, whether it's new car, used car, or whether it's real estate, or whether it's just taking care of making sure the groceries are on the shelf at home. 
All right, next up, we've got Dr. Michael Paffer. Dr. Paffer, are you on the line there? Yes, sir, Senator. Thanks very much for having me. Well, thank you for being on, and uh, tell your family, thank you for taking time out on a Saturday to spend a little time on the Kim Hammer Show. Let's start off, first of all, by your qualifications, if you would, and your background and maybe your areas of expertise, just so the listeners will have an idea of what uh, what your area of practice is in. Certainly. So <clears throat> I'm a hospital specialist. I uh, trained in internal medicine and finished residency in 2004. Um, so I, I've been doing this a little bit of time, and, I, and my practice has been focused on hospital medicine since 2008. So, uh, you know, we, I'm the director of the hospitalist uh, program at Celine, and I, I do some work at some other area hospitals as well. And uh, most people don't really know what a hospitalist is. The easiest way for people to understand it, if, if you go to the ER and you're sick enough that you can't go home, then I'm the doctor that ends up taking care of you in the hospital. Very good. And let's just kind of bring it to, uh, to the forefront. From your perspective, what are you seeing as the greatest challenges facing you as a physician in dealing with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the patients and just the holistic uh, issue of the COVID-19? That's a very good question. And, you know, honestly, the biggest challenge is how fast everything changes. Like, um, you know, uh, thinking of this in, in two phases, I mean, it, it's it's been going on longer than six weeks, but the most intense period has been pretty much the last six to eight weeks. And this last week is very much different than the first week, and the second week was very much different from the first week. And so there's just an incredible amount of information that comes, and this is the only time I've practiced where your practice has to change so quickly with uh, new information that's coming out. Do you, um, as far as your thoughts with regards to how it is being handled or how we can best work to bring the COVID-19 situation under control. And and one reason I want to have you on and, and have uh, Dr. Albion on later, because he kind of practices in a different field. You're in the hospital. You deal with the ER. You're the hospitals that takes care of it. Uh, just recently, Selim Memorial uh, had a successful, uh, achieved some successful results with a COVID-19 patient going home. That was on the news this past week. But one of the reasons I wanted to get you and Dr. Albion is because you're actually in the trenches dealing with it and, and in that direct patient care uh, environment. So as far as your thoughts regarding how we can best work to bring COVID-19 under control from a physician that's in the trenches, what are your thoughts or what are your recommendations? Yeah. So um, I, I would say first, in general, I think as a nation, we've done a pretty good job um, handling this. And and uh, I say that mostly because of my first comment about how quickly things change. Uh, you know, that's the hardest thing for huge numbers of people to do is respond to things that change so quickly. And I think, um, you know, if you look back over the last six to eight weeks, you can see evidence of how we've had to change gears and do different things. In terms of getting through this the rest of the way, the the thing that I'm most happy about is there seems to be a gathering discussion about how different areas of the country need to respond to this differently. And I think that that's a very critical part of this. You know, there when we talk about diseases and how diseases make us sick, um, there are different risk factors, and those risk factors vary in different geographic locations. And, uh, you know, I guess one of the good examples of that is how different the transportation system is in Arkansas compared to New York. You know, in these really population-dense areas where you have to have public transportation because there's not room to park your car and things like that, it, it, it's going to have a very different uh, way that certain illnesses affect that area than do here. And so it seems like there's a growing discussion about the importance of tailoring the approach to what makes sense for your local environment. I think that's very important. 
as far as the practices we're using, uh, do you feel that we're in the right direction? Are we overkill in certain areas under utilizing in others? You, it depends on who you talk to. Uh, some people swear up and down that wearing a mask is what you're supposed to be doing. Some people will swear at you if you're wearing a mask. I know with the right. restaurants opening up this week, uh, you know, some are being more compliant than other, and, it, and it's kind of creating a tension, you know, in, in the real world environment. Uh, some people say you ought to wear gloves and others say no, because, you know, that transmits the disease even faster. So as far as yeah. the what's being presented as best practices out there, from your perspective, what do you think is working or what is not working? And what do you feel about all those? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that a lot of what we're seeing is kind of a natural growing pain, so to speak, because, um, you know, each of us have to kind of make our own decisions about what our risk factors are, how, how susceptible we might be to the illness, and be in a position that we can do what we need to do to protect ourselves and protect our families and protect others, too. So, you know, personally for me, um, I, I do wear a mask all the time when I'm in the hospital. Um, you know, if, if I'm in a situation where I'm not going to be within six feet of anybody or that I can walk around somebody to stay outside of six feet, certainly I take those kind of precautions. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about whether masks prevent the virus. I don't I don't know that they prevent it, but the thing is, the current thinking right now is that this virus is mostly spread by what's called droplet contagion. And that means little bits of spittle and things that come out of our mouth every day, that, that's what's actually carrying the germ. It's not airborne and, and floating as much as we think it's really droplet spread. And there is no doubt that covering your own mouth would decrease the amount of droplets that are just floating around in the air randomly. And so in that regard, I think it's probably wise that, that we do some of that. But I think it also has to be up to individuals and what their own circumstances are. You know, there's been discussion about whether you should wear masks at the park. Well... I, I don't know that it helps that much. Certainly, if you live in the house with somebody or you drove in the car with somebody to that park, you staying six feet away from that person that you were just in a small closed space with, you know, that doesn't really make any sense. And I think that's where the overkill is, is in some areas, you know, our zeal to enforce these laws might be a little bit overboard. Um, does that answer the question? Uh, I think it does. I mean, it takes us in the direction that, that and, and let me ask you as far as a physician, because I've been in, you know, some debates on legislation re involving physicians and it, it's kind of, and I'm a preacher. Okay. So it's like getting two preachers in the room, some things you're going to agree on, some things you disagree yeah. <laughs> on. And that's just the nature of the beast as a physician working in the hospital environment, how do you balance between what you experience in the environment that you are in and what comes down as recommendations, either at a national level or a state level, and put that into application in the world where you live? Because uh, sometimes we agree and sometimes we disagree. Just talk about your, your philosophy of how you go about achieving the balance, maintaining your independence as a physician, but then dealing with directives maybe that come down from the, the state or the federal level. Right. So th that's a, that's an excellent question. And you're a hundred percent correct that between professionals, uh, there can certainly be disagreement on certain um, issues. And, but what I've noticed about medicine is where you see disagreement, it's usually because there's really not an authoritative answer. Um, I'll give you an example. You know, if you ask 10 different physicians whether you should be on antibiotics to treat bacterial pneumonia, all 10 of them will say yes. Now, if 
five of them might suggest this one antibiotic and point to circumstances that they think make that one antibiotic right. And then the other five might point to a different antibiotic and be able to point to circumstances that they think defend their antibiotic being right. And I think that's something that it's hard for the public to see sometimes is when you're listening to the medical community and you're getting varied answers, it's usually because there's really not a definitive answer that tells us because as soon as the science is convincing, then those various answers kind of go away and then you're just getting one. And that's the problem right now when there's so much new information is we've not really had time to answer a lot of these things definitively. And that's why, you know, the answers are kind of all over the map. The way that you balance that, I think, is you make yourself aware of the authoritative answers when they're there. And certainly you try to be consistent and correct when there is authority to, to say this is the way to do it. But then when you're dealing with something that there that's within a gray area, then you really need to tailor that for what's right for that individual patient. And that's why uh, allowing communities to have local strategies for how they're going to combat this really makes a whole lot of sense. Which kind of goes back to your first point. If we're in New York, you're going to handle it one way. But if you're in central Arkansas, and that can even vary from Little Rock to Benton or Conway or just what the, some of the dynamics are, uh, you might you might choose to handle it differently. Let me exactly. let me go out on this last question uh, because you're in the hospital setting. The demands and the challenges of the hospital setting. Uh, what do you see are some of the some of the biggest uh, adjustments that you've had to make in the hospital setting? Right. So. You know, the biggest is is containment. Um, you know, we've had to make a lot of different choices about which patients we should isolate and how likely are they to have illness, and um, and and so that's still a big uh, uh, issue for hospitals because once we tag this person as somebody who could have it or could infect others, then there's a large resource expenditure um, towards that. And so we we kind of have to balance that. We have to make sure we're doing everything we can, not only to keep that patient safe, but keep other patients safe. And um, But then at the same time, we, we have to be mindful of our resources and not overuse them. And so that's probably the biggest challenge right now. Well, and then you take away your inability as a hospital to do elective surgeries, which I know there's an effort to get that back up, but you got to have PPEs right. and it's a, it's not a simple wave your magic wand and fix it kind of deal. Uh, but yeah. it, you know, at least moving in the right direction. All right. Any parting words yeah. you want to share with my listeners as far as uh, life from the physician or the view of a physician in a hospital? Um, you know, I, I guess the only parting suggestions I would have is, you know, everybody, please keep your ears open. Try to try to stay safe, make intelligent decisions for you and your family. Uh, I, I firmly believe we're going to get through this, and I think we're starting to see some of that now. Uh, the only other thing I'd like to comment on, I, I will go ahead and toot Dr. Albee's horn just a little bit because I know him well enough to know that he wouldn't say this himself, but uh, he is in a position that he has to make some important decisions to manage his patient population, and he's made some really good decisions. You know, everybody's heard some about how this affects uh, nursing homes, and Dr. Albee was very early on um, trying to protect his patient population from this contagion. And now that we're seeing what happened in states like New York and Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, I think it's easy to see what a good idea that was. And that's one reason I wanted to get him on, because Dr. Alvey not only has a practice that he deals with the general public, but he's a medical director over a facility dealing with our most vulnerable population. And yeah. uh, and I appreciate you taking time away from your family being on today, and I appreciate you as an individual, as a physician, and 
you know, what you do for the community. So our guest today has been Dr. Michael Pafford, and uh, he's brought you some insight as far as a physician working within the hospital setting. And Dr. Pafford, thank you for taking time to be on the Kim Hammer Show today. Thank you so much, Senator. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, sir. All right, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we should be joined by Congressman Bruce Westerman. We'll kind of get the update from what's going on in Washington. As you know, there's the big debate over the next level of funding for the CARES package. We'll get some firsthand information from him, not only about that, but catch up on a few other things of interest. So when we come back from the break, uh, you know, you'll be ready, hopefully, to be able to listen to Congressman Bruce Westman. I want to say thank you to my sponsors, Everett Buick, GMC in Saline County, Baxley Phillips, Mounty in Saline County, but representing all of central Arkansas as well as uh, Everett Buick, G- Buick, GMC, representing all of Arkansas, and then Edwards Food Store here in central Arkansas and also over in east Arkansas. Three great businesses that all have a personal touch when you walk into their stores or into their businesses. You're listening to The Kim Hammer Show. We'll be back with Congressman Bruce Westerman in just a minute. This week in the Town Hall Review with Hugh Hewitt, sponsored by the Pepperdine Graduate School of Public Policy and ADF, Alliance Defending Freedom. As the nation enters its seventh week of shutdown, the money fight is raging on Capitol Hill. We just want to make sure that tax dollars are supporting our response to the virus. Join us for our program. Sign up for our podcast at townhallreview.com. Town Hall Review with Hugh Hewitt, Saturdays at 7 a.m. on 101.1 FM. The Answer. Uncle Sam can't wait for you to retire because he could tax you at every turn, including taxes on your IRA and 401k, taxes on your Social Security, and taxes on your investment income. It could be a field day for the government unless you take steps to protect yourself now. Learn the strategies and opportunities that could help you save thousands of dollars in taxes on The David Lucas Show this Saturday at 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. right here on 101.1. The answer. Pat Davis is yourhealthplanman.com. He wants to remind you that God is good and has a great plan for you. He's enjoyed the Lord's favor for almost 50 years now. Besides ministry in various forms, his passion is helping people find the right health insurance plan for their unique and individual needs. People are paying way too much and in many cases are paying a mortgage payment for health insurance and have huge deductibles, says Pat. For me, this is another ministry. He can put you on a plan all year round. He loves saving his clients consistently up to 50% and more on premiums. Pat has found ways to teach how simple health insurance can be and how you can take back control of your health care. People are looking to him and saving thousands on insurance and learning better ways to save money on procedures, hospital stays, and little things like office visits. His clients know he cares and find it very refreshing that an agent will offer what he and his wife have for an insurance plan. Let Pat see how he can help you. Go now to yourhealthplanman.com or call him now, 501-605-6935. I'm John Reynolds, owner of Reynolds Remodeling and Home Improvement. I want you to know that we are committed to providing the best remodeling and home improvement services in central Arkansas. We can take on any project, kitchens, baths, drywall, painting, and exterior work too. Decks, privacy fences, pressure washing, soffit and fascia repair, you name it. Reynolds Remodeling and Home Improvement is a locally owned, family operated business who loves serving our community in central Arkansas. Call us today at 501 808 8800. A stock market that's breaking record after record, potential rising interest rates. And how can any of us forget the $20 trillion in national debt? Hey, it's David Lucas. What does all this mean to you and your investments? And how do you protect everything you've worked so hard for while at the same time making the most out of every nickel you've saved for retirement? I'll reveal the answer to these questions and much more on The David Lucas Show this Saturday at 10 a.m. on 101.1 FM. The answer. Hey, welcome back to the Kim Hammer Show on a uh, what could be a stormy afternoon. So keep your eye on the weather this afternoon. But thank you for taking time to Listen in on the Kim Hammer Show here on 101.1 FM, The Answer. If you're watching on Facebook Live, uh, we appreciate you joining in. Always want to encourage you, if you would, to please share this program with your friends. If you're looking to advertise on the show, uh, just send me an email, and you can get uh, in contact with us on our website, which is thekimhammershow.com, thekimhammershow.com. Also, you can be kept up to date with current events that are going on by following my website. Uh, on the radio now, we have Congressman Bruce Westerman, uh, who actually, I think, has pulled over to the side of the road to maintain a signal. So, Congressman, appreciate you taking time to be on the Kim Hammer Show this afternoon. 
Yeah, Kim, good to be with you, and I hope hope we've got a good signal here. That I'm in a place where it's uh, kind of slim pickings on the signal. Well, we can hear you well, and uh, let me respect your time by just kind of getting right into it and asking you. Uh, there's another, you know, funding package I think you all voted on yesterday. Uh, can you talk about the contents of what's in that and just give us an up-to-date on, or give us an update on that, please? Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, just getting back from D.C., and, um, you, you know, it was actually two very bad things that we had to go up and vote on, and one of them was this $3 trillion wish list that the speaker put out that, um, you know, really has not a lot to do with the pandemic, uh, but a lot to do with um, her liberal agenda. And she knew, without a doubt, she knew that this wasn't going anywhere outside of the House chamber. Uh, but, you know, it's an election year and she wanted a messaging bill out there and uh, something that she can claim that, you know, Republicans don't care about people. That's what they'll say. Uh, but if people will dig into the bill, they'll see what's what's really in there, where it's um, changing voter laws, you know, federalizing elections, which the Constitution says that's a function of the states to carry out elections. Um, they, they had a bill, H.R. 1, which that's, you know, the number one bill they introduced was election reforms, that they passed it out of the House as a messaging bill, knowing it's not going anywhere. And they basically took H.R. 1, which is California voting laws, and put them into this bill to, to federalize elections across the, the country. Um, you know, that's that's bad enough if they'd just done that. Uh, but <clears throat> they've uh, put $3 trillion of spending out there and a lot of it are things that are not related to the uh, coronavirus. And even the things that are, they put provisions in it, uh, like to, uh, you know, protect Planned Parenthood to, um, you know, it, somebody said it mentions pot in the bill more than it does the pandemic. Uh, you know, wanting to uh, change all the banking laws to, to make marijuana a, a non-cash business and their um, the justification behind that is because when you pass cash, you're you're transmitting. Uh, you could transmit the virus, uh, and it's just chock full of things like that. Uh, saying that um, you, know, you you can have a, a tax identifier number, which would allow um, people who aren't legal residents to receive the benefits, and it just it just goes down the list of bad stuff that was in the bill. There could be additional funding from the federal government, but I think we first need to wait and see how the funding in the CARES Act is dispersed and how the economy is starting back up. And the last thing we need is a is the largest spending bill ever proposed um, that has a lot to do about everything but the pandemic. I think the biggest thing listening to constituents in my area is that they want us just to get out of the way so that they can get business open back up and it'll take care of itself. I would, you know, just encourage that before we go $3 trillion in debt for something that's really not associated with the, uh, you know, with the pandemic that we would, that we would just give what we have an opportunity to work. I know, uh, I know you are very in touch with what's going on here in Arkansas because I hear your name mentioned uh, very often as far as, you know, knowing the pulse of things, but we as a legislator, legislature is just in the administration have just approved $147 million to small businesses to help them get back up and going. Is that the, is that the general attitude at the national level, at least among the conservatives is to just hit the pause button? And how long do you think it would be that we would have to have the pause button held before you would want to take something back up again? Well, it's the the virus, I think, will dictate that. And it's how we respond to the virus. Uh, if we're continuing to keep the, the numbers down, if we're able to open up uh, businesses without seeing uh, big spikes. Um, that's And the other part of that, Kim, was consumer confidence. It doesn't matter if you've got something open if nobody's willing to go do business there whether it's a hospital for elective surgeries, a dentist office, or a restaurant, 
for those businesses to operate, you've got to have um, have customers there. So it's very important that we get the guidelines out, that people follow those guidelines, and that the confidence builds back up to where uh, people will go back out uh, into the economy. And, you know, I just told you one of the bad things we voted on and didn't even touch on everything that was in that bill. But, and as I said, everybody knew that was not going anywhere outside of the House chamber. Uh, the Senate, Mitch McConnell said he wouldn't take it up. And the president issued a, a statement of administrative policy or a veto threat is what that is. Um, but the thing that did get voted on that will happen because it was just a rule change in the House done by a, a majority of votes uh, down party lines was to do uh, proxy voting, which means that uh, from now on, members don't even have to go back to D.C. to vote, that they can give their vote to another member who can go there with uh, with 10 votes. So if we had a if we had the full 435 members in Congress, it takes 218 votes to pass a bill. With the quorum we had there yesterday, it only took 205 votes. But with um, with the full quorum, which I don't even know how you get a quorum if you don't have members there, but apparently they put that in the rule change too. 22 people can change, uh, can pass bills out of the House. They can walk in with uh, 10 proxy votes. You know, we've our country has been through our rich history. And never before were members of Congress afraid to go do their job. Um, but now uh, they are. You know, I was talking to members who were there during 9-11 who said they were getting anthrax mailed to their office and death threats, and they still went and did their job. Uh, but uh, so it makes you wonder, is it really that there's a health concern that somebody's afraid to do their job, or is it a manipulation by the speaker to try to push stuff through without going through committees and having any kind of an open process and trying to create political leverage going into the election. Do you ever just get tired, Bruce, of having to constantly battle against the mentality of the Democrats up there and the trickery that they use and just the assault on the Constitution and just the fabric of America? I, I'm just curious. You you deal with it at a higher level than we deal with it around here. And, and I just want to commend you as a congressman because you just seem to have your head down and steady, you know, steady plodding. But how in the world do you keep up with it? And I think about the president and the barrage of, you know, insanity that he gets from the media. How, how do you guys support each other and maintain each other's ability to lift each other up as a, as a party and as a, as a group? Yeah, well, I uh, appreciate your, your kind words there, Kim. And you, you've you served with me in the legislature. You you know, I'm usually pretty pretty calm and even killed person, I think. I try not to let things bother me a whole lot. But when they do stuff like that, I, it brings out the competitive nature in me. And there's there are good people who are Democrats that serve in Congress that I know personally. But when it comes to policy and the way I see Pelosi and the left wing of the party and all that stuff happening, uh, it just makes me want to go just beat them like a drum in the election because until we get the majority back, they're going to keep doing that. And, uh, you know, I came back from D.C. with a renewed um, fire to to win my election, to win, um, to make sure all of our delegation stays intact and to go out and work my rear off so that we can get uh, the majority back and get the gavel out of Pelosi's hand. Uh, because it's, it, you know, we're we're here in a a pandemic. We're seeing all this turmoil in the economy, and uh, she won't take us back or let us go back to D.C. to have committee hearings and pass bills through normal order. She wants to write these bills in her office and put them out there to vote. And now they're going to be able to vote without having to bring their members back uh, to do it. So I I really hope the American people are watching closely to what's happening. And I really hope that wasn't a fluke out in California where that Republican won, um, flipped the seat from from blue to red in California for the first time since 1998. Well, we enjoy uh, – oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I think they uh, – they seem to always overplay their hand, but they seem to never get caught in it. And a lot of the mainstream media 
uh, help make that happen. And it's it's where, you know, that frustration that you see with the president, he doesn't hold anything back. Um, but he's he's facing this every day at a, at a much higher level. And, you know, he, he brings a lot of that uh, on himself, but he uh, he's doing it because he's fighting for this country. Let me go back to the proxy. Did the did the rule change in the House apply only as long as the pandemic is recognized as going on or is this indefinite? No, it's uh, it's there until it's changed back. Or and, and I'm, when a new Congress is sworn in, there will be a new set of rules. But the, um, the majority can change the rules with a majority vote at any time. But there's some thought that this is unconstitutional, that there's you know specific provisions in Article One about quorum and members. And the word Congress literally means uh, coming together for a meeting. Uh, so there's there's a good chance that will get challenged in court as well as um, but it's not going anywhere. But the federal voting provisions that they federalized voting provisions they put in the three trillion dollar bill uh, that would definitely get a court challenge if if somehow the Senate took it up and passed it. The um, you mentioned about the you know about the poc- about the proxy and the and the pandemic and how they're utilizing it for political advantage i think that's one thing that makes it a little bit harder out here in the community uh, or what i see shaping up as far as it being a little bit harder in the community for people to look at the pandemic seriously is because of the political manipulation that's occurring uh on the part of the democrats at the national level uh to utilize uh, the pandemic as as a means to try to get other things through, which lessens uh, the view of the reality of the pandemic. So people are not as, you know, motivated to do the things that they're being asked to do. Uh, do you think that's a yeah, fair assessment or is that just a little well, bit off kilter? Well, you're just basically repeating what they've said. They've, um, you know, Clyburn made the reference to you know, we've got to use this pandemic as leverage to get our uh, policies in place. That, and they've they've been on record saying things like that. That uh, this is an opportunity. You know, um, they said it in the Obama administration. You know, never let a um, whatever it was a, a tragedy go to waste or a, a national emergency. It's, it's, it's the same idea that they see an opportunity to. Put these liberal, um, I, I call them anti-American ideas, uh, into public policy. So, what else are you? I think uh, really. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say I think they really go against the the grain and the founding of of our country, and uh, it's not classic liberalism. It's a it's a, a modern liberalism that really came from the, the French Revolution. If you track the if you uh, trace it back, it's the idea that you have uh, freedom and no responsibility, where a, a conservative idea of, of um, government is that you have freedom, but it comes with responsibility. With, uh, with regards to your uh, prediction for the fall, you mentioned uh, what, I, what I personally believe is more, I, I don't think it's a fluke what happened in California. I think it's a strong message that people are sending that they're tired of, you know, the agenda that's being pushed by the liberals. So do you have a particular prediction as far as what you think will happen this fall as as far as being able to take the house back based on what you're hearing? Well, I mean, just looking at the data there, there are 32 seats that Democrats uh, sit in right now that Trump won in 2016. Um, Some of those it's, it's mind-boggling that we lost them. The seat out in Oklahoma City, um, we should win that back. There's a seat in South Carolina, we should win back. Uh, and really, all of those 32 seats are definitely in play. We need to win 17 now to get the majority back. But then you got seats like uh, a guy named David Valadeo out in California that um, on election night in 2018, he was ahead by seven points. 
three weeks later when they quit counting votes and and uh, and found enough votes to be ahead of him, they called the election. I think there were five races in California that we won on election night in 2018 that were Republican held seats that uh, were flipped later on as the Democrats kept going out and rounding up or bringing in votes, you know, ballot harvesting. They have uh, same day voter registration, uh, no voter ID. And it's the, uh, and, and then for Pelosi to have the gall to come back and make that HR one, like their signature piece of legislation that they wanted to do that across the country. So what else are you working on in the time we got left? Anything other than uh, you got the CARES Act and then you got the House rule change? Anything that uh, Congressman Westerman's working on that he wants to make people aware of? Oh, yeah. I've got my Trillion Trees Act that I've been working on. You know, used to trees were uh, considered to be like the best thing you could do for the environment until, I, until a Republican filed a bill about planting trees. And now you got uh, liberals coming out talking about how, how trees and wood are bad. So, uh it just it makes me shake my head sometimes, but we're going to keep fighting, and uh, we, this is a great country. Uh, it's worth fighting for. A lot of people have, have sacrificed a lot more than we're sacrificing right now uh, to get us where we're at. And uh, you know, as long as I got breath to do that, I'm going to be uh, fighting for this country and for what's right, and against these crazy ideas that really undermine um, our our country and why it's here. Th- last uh, last point, and I'll let you go. So they're wanting to add three trillion dollars. How much more can we go before we break? I mean, it, you're, you know, they're just keep adding straw to the back of the camel, uh, and one of these straws is going to break it. Your your thoughts on that? Uh, that's a number I hope we never see, but and it's a number we don't really know what it is. We may have already passed that number. Um, but when you look at the history of the country and you look at, um, you know, it started concerning me when in D.C. a few years back, uh, we stopped talking about the total amount of debt, but started phrasing it differently as the debt as a percentage of GDP. Because I think everybody was embarrassed to talk about 15 or 16 trillion dollars of debt. Um, so they looked at it and said, well, but our, our debt to GDP ratio is is only about 80%. Uh, well, we're up over one one to one debt to GDP ratio. That's where Greece was in 2008. It's, uh, uh, of course, Greece doesn't control the world currency like we do. Uh, but we're now at a point to where our debt to GDP ratio is equivalent to World War II, the highest it's ever been. Uh, so you think about everything that this country put out and the sacrifices that were made to win World War II. And fortunately, we had an economy that came back after the war and we didn't have out of control spending. We were able to pay that debt back down. We were in a horrible position on a debt, in a horrible debt position before the pandemic ever came along. And that's why uh, myself and others in Congress who are fiscal conservatives we're constantly harping on we've got to get our deficit down, get our deficit in control and get our debt down. Because if something comes along that requires that spending, um, you don't want to tag on top of debt that's already there. But you get into this situation like this, and there's really not uh, uh, good alternatives on what to do. You, know, you could just uh, shut everything down and let businesses fold up and uh, let the economy tumble and be back in, you know, like the, the Great Depression. All right, um, Congressman, the, I'm going to have to interrupt you. Where's the, sweet, where's the sweet spot? Yeah. All right. I tell you, uh, I'm down to less than a minute. What I'd like to do maybe is get you back on sometime. Let's talk about our, our debt to China and have that conversation, and we'll work that out. And I appreciate you taking time out this afternoon. Tell your family thank you, and especially pulling off the side of the road. So, That's been my guest today, uh, Congressman Bruce Westerman. Always appreciate his service. Uh, Dr. Albee was not able to come on because he sent me a message, and he was detained, as you might expect. A doctor might be detained from time to time unexpectedly, but we'll get him on the show next week. Uh, I've got another physician, actually, I want to bring on as well. You've been listening to the Kim Hammer Show this afternoon. Thank you to Everett Buick GMC, Baxley Phillips Mowdy, 
and Edwards Food Store here in Central Arkansas. You've been listening to The Kim Hammer Show. Go up to KimHammer.com to follow us on our website. Have a good afternoon. 101.1 FM, The Answer. KDXE FM, Kamek Village, Little Rock. A Salem Media Group station. 101.1 FM, The Answer.